When you're little, you think everyone lives like you do, that what happens in your house is the same as what happens in other houses in your street. So I thought that all eight-year-olds had handprints on their faces, went to bed with bruises. But when I started school, I realised that not everyone was living in the same world that I did. You must think I was a very naughty girl to get smacked like that, but I wasn't. It was just that in my house, the rules kept changing. I'd go into the lounge room and start swinging on the furniture whilst Mum and my sister were watching TV. Wasn't making much noise, just doing what kids do, but instead of getting told to stop, she'd smack my head to the ground, hurting my nose. Next time we went to the doctor, he'd say to Mum, Did you know Natalie has a broken nose? And she'd say, Oh, that must have happened when she bumped into the wall the other day. And that's the way it always was throughout my childhood. Me with bruises, welts, broken bones, with no one ever being brave enough to find out why. There was nothing I ever really did to set it off. I might just be walking past her and she'd say, get out of my sight. The next thing I know, I'd be ducking from a flying object, trying to escape out of the room. I spent so much of my time trying to make myself as invisible as possible because I thought if she couldn't notice me, then she'd leave me alone. When I was about 13, Mum decided that perhaps the best way to get me out of her sight was to stop acknowledging me. So she started setting the table for two, one place for her and one for my sister. And that was the way it stayed. She started cooking for two, so I'd have to stay awake later than the others and sneak food out of the fridge to feed myself. And I got very good at inviting myself over for dinner at friends' houses. One day Mum found me sneaking some leftovers out of the fridge and she said, What the hell do you think you're doing? You don't contribute any money to this household, so you have no right to take anything from it. And then she punched my face so hard she broke my jaw. I thought things might be better if I went and lived with Dad for a while. At least I could get a good feed over there. But Dad had remarried and had two more kids of his own. Even though he always paid my mum maintenance, he made it pretty clear that he had a new family now and they were his main priority. One day I had this terrible pain in my stomach. I told my stepmum, but she didn't believe me. She thought I just wanted attention. My dad wouldn't take me to the doctor because he said he had to work. So instead of walking the 20 minutes down the road to the doctor, over the highway, past the pub filled with men, in the dark, on my own, I called my mum. She came and got me and took me to the doctor, who told me that my appendix had burst. When I got out of the hospital, I went back to live with mum again, and things were okay for a while. I had to stay in bed for what seemed like forever and my baby sister used to come in and sit with me after school. One day she said, promise me you'll never go away again. And I said, why? Did you miss me? She said, no, but when you go she starts to take it out on me. But once I was able to get out of bed it all started again. You're worthless. I wish you'd never been born. Get out of my life. You'll never amount to anything in your life. And if I was ever in her way or if she got the chance, she'd beat me for no reason at all. At least my sister was safe again. One day she came into my room, stood in the doorway and said, I finally figured it out. Either you have schizophrenia or you were sexually abused as a child. So which is it? She decided to take me to a psychologist to get me sorted out. But every time they got a little close to the truth, she'd end the therapy and take me off to a new one. We'd start all over again with her trying to get the therapist to tell her that I was a schizophrenic. Finally, I saw a therapist who was quite clever. She worked out what was being said by my mum didn't make any sense, and she convinced mum to let us continue with family therapy, but also to allow me to have one-on-one therapy with her in between those sessions. She said to me, we have to be really clever here. You mustn't tell your mum anything about what we talk about together. And after I told her my story, she agreed that I had to get out of that house. She agreed to help me find somewhere else to live. I was 14 years of age. I knew my mum wouldn't care if I left, but I worried about my sister. If we saw each other, my mum would spend hours interrogating her about what we'd done. Her questions were always really cruel. I knew it was taking its toll. After a while, I realised that the only way to protect my sister was to stop seeing her. So at the end of our last visit together, I made her a promise. I said to her, listen, I've got myself a mobile phone. Here's the number, and I promise you that I'll never get rid of this number. So you can always call me if you ever need my help. And I still have that phone, and it's still always turned on. But she's never called. When a vacancy finally came up at the youth hostel, I was so relieved and couldn't wait to move in. And while I was there, I met a whole group of other young women who had lived in homes just like mine, 
and learnt that what had happened in my house wasn't so different to what happened in many other homes. Unfortunately, in some cases, what had happened in my home was better than how some of my new friends had to live their lives. Having spent eight years feeling different from everyone else, this was finally my time to know that I was okay and that everything would be all right. Once I left the hostel, I managed to secure a rental property. I've been able to hang on to that place for seven years now. That's right. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie, and it's been 2,555 days since I was last homeless. You might think that's funny, thinking of yourself in that way, but every day I have to remember that I've got nowhere to go back to if things go wrong. If I lose this place or get behind on the rent, I can't go back home and stay with my mum to get back on my feet, so this home means so much more to me than it might for other people. And having been in a position where I had nowhere to call my own, I'd never do anything to jeopardise it. I work as a teacher now in a high school. It's a working class school, but the kids are all pretty good. When I see them out in the playground, I wonder how it was that when I was at school that no adult noticed how much pain and trouble I was in or that no one was willing to help. Sometimes I just sit with the kids and listen to whatever they want to say. And they say, everyone says I'll never amount to anything. Or they all say, I'm just no good. Or they say, oh miss, what's the point? I'm only going to end up on the dole anyway. And I say, no, you're all worth something and can do anything you want with your lives. You just have to believe in yourself. Well, someone's got to stand up for them, don't they? And I reckon I want to be one of those people because all they need is one person.